Hi, I'm Michael Correa, and this is Psych Exam Review. In the last video, I talked about behavioral genetics, and we saw how twin studies can be used to estimate the influence of genes on particular traits or behaviors. But one of the things I mentioned was that we can't see the role of individual genes. We're just getting an estimate of the relative strength of genes compared to the environment. So in molecular genetics, we're going to look at specific gene interactions, so the role of specific genes on particular traits, behaviors, or illnesses. And so we'll start by looking at some chromosomal abnormalities. So we mentioned in a previous video that uh, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes, and you get half of each pair from your mom and half from your dad. But in getting these chromosome pairs, errors can occur. You can end up with extra copies, or you can be missing part of a chromosome. And so these are the chromosomal abnormalities that we'll talk about. And when we talk about all of your chromosomes, we can refer to your karyotype. So your karyotype is the total number and the size and shape of all your chromosomes. That's your karyotype. So these would be some karyotype abnormalities. Okay, the first of these is Down syndrome. And you've probably heard of this. And Down syndrome is a chromosomal abnormality. And it results in intellectual impairment. And it also results in certain characteristic physical features. So uh, sort of flattened face with upward slanted eyes uh, and some other physical characteristics. So why are these occurring? Well, what happens in Down syndrome is that you get an extra copy of the 21st pair of your chromosome, right? So instead of having two halves to this 21st pair, you have three. And so this is referred to as trisomy for three chromosomes. Instead of two halves, you get three, and this is the cause of Down syndrome. Now at this point, I want to point out that there's a difference between these two words here. When we say that something is genetic versus when we say that it's inherited, you might think these words mean the same thing, but they don't. Because we can say that Down syndrome is genetic. It occurs in the genes. It's, it's a genetic abnormality that causes Down syndrome. But Down syndrome isn't really inherited. And what I mean by that is it's not passed down from your parents. It's not the case that your parents have this extra copy and they pass it on to you. So you don't inherit Down syndrome from your parents, even though it's genetic. And you don't pass Down syndrome on for the most part, because most people who have Down syndrome are going to be sterile. They're going to be incapable of having children. That's true of males with Down syndrome, and it's true of about half of females with Down syndrome. They're not able to have children. So it's not the case that Down syndrome uh, is being passed on through generations. Each time Down syndrome occurs, it's usually a new mutation. It's this mutation, this chromosomal abnormality that just happened to occur for that person. Um, and it could, you know, happen at any time. It wasn't uh, the result of anything in the parent's genes that caused the Down syndrome to occur. It's not inherited, even though it is genetic. Okay, let's look at a couple other chromosomal abnormalities. Both of the next two examples are going to occur on the 23rd pair. Right? And the 23rd pair is where you get the chromosomes that determine whether you're male or whether you're female. Now, if you're male, then this pair looks like this. You have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. If you're female, you have two X chromosomes. Okay, So it's this Y chromosome here that makes you male. And now when these two people here are going to have offspring, the mom can only give an X chromosome, right? She's either going to give you this one or this one, right? So you get half from your mom. So she's going to give you one of these and the other half from your dad. So if your dad gives you his X chromosome, then you're going to be female. If your dad gives you his Y chromosome, then you're going to be male. Now, if you think about this, this means that if you're male, that your Y chromosome, of course, came from your dad. And well, where did he get it? Well, he got that same Y chromosome from his dad and he got it from his dad, and he got it from his dad. We can actually trace the Y chromosome through the male line. We can find your male ancestors just by that Y chromosome. That can tell you exactly who your dad was. He's going to be the person with that same Y chromosome, and his dad had it, and his dad had it like that. Whereas for females, we can't do this, because we look at the X chromosome, we go back and say, okay, well, let's say it came from your mom here. Ooh, did this one come from her mom or her dad? It could be either. Did that come from her mom or her dad, right? We get sort of lost. It can jump back and forth between coming from the male side or the female side. Uh, so for females, if we want to trace the female line, we can follow the mitochondria. And this is kind of a sidebar here, but the idea is that uh, sperm cells don't have mitochondria, so you don't get any mitochondria from your dad. 
Uh, but egg cells do have mitochondria. So all of your mitochondria come from the egg, which obviously came from your mom. And where did she get that from her mom's egg? So where did she get that from her mom's egg? So you can trace the female line with mitochondria. Okay, but let's get back to our chromosomal abnormalities. Okay, so you either get XY or XX to make you male or female. Or, you might have guessed, you get some other thing that might happen. You could end up with Turner syndrome. So what happens in Turner syndrome? Well, in Turner syndrome, you get an X, and then you don't get the other half. It's missing. So you're XO, right? You only have one uh, chromosome on this pair. So what happens? Well, you're going to be female. So why are you going to be female? Well, because we're all female initially. Female is sort of the default state in terms of development. We start as female, and then if we have a Y chromosome, it turns us into males. So you don't have a Y chromosome, so you won't get turned into male, so you're going to be female. Um, unfortunately, you're going to also be sterile, so you won't be able to have children. So again, this means this is genetic, but it's not going to be inheritance because it's not getting passed on. Um, and you're going to have some characteristic physical features as well. So uh, people with Turner syndrome tend to have a webbed neck. So the, the skin on their neck is kind of webbed and uh, they tend to have swollen feet and they may or may not have some ambiguous genitalia. So they might have some uh, sort of strange development of their genitals that don't look exactly uh, male or female. They might look a little uh, somewhere in between. Uh, okay, so that's Turner syndrome. Now let's look at another chromosomal abnormality on the 23rd pair. And this is Klinefelter syndrome. And in Klinefelter, what happens is uh, you have an XY, so you're going to be male. There's that Y chromosome making you male. But you also have an extra X. So we have trisomy here. We have three chromosomes on this, what should be a pair. Okay, so what happens when you have Klinefelter syndrome? So you're going to be male. Uh, you're likely to be sterile. Uh, some males with Klinefelter syndrome are able to produce sperm, but um, you're probably going to be sterile if you have this. Maybe not. Uh, but you also have some other physical characteristics. So you're likely to develop breasts. Uh, you tend to be taller than average, and you tend to have smaller than average testicles. So that's uh, what happens to Klinefelter syndrome. And you may also have ambiguous genital development. Um, that can also happen in Klinefelter syndrome. Okay, I want to, uh, before I move on, I want to talk about one other thing. This is not a chromosomal abnormality, but it's related to this idea that we have these chromosomes, um, and but then we don't necessarily fully develop as totally male or female. There are some other possibilities that can occur. And so I want to talk about AIS. And the reason I want to talk about this is because it was in the news within the past week, and so you may have heard about it. Uh, so AIS, this is androgen insensitivity syndrome. And the reason you may have heard of it recently is that there's a Belgian model um, named uh, Hannah Gabby Odile, and she recently came out and said that she's um, she's intersex, and she's not meaning she's not really male or female, and she's intersex because she has this androgen insensitivity syndrome. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, if we look at her chromosomes, she's male, right? She has XY as her chromosome, so why isn't why isn't she really uh, male, so to say? Uh, well, she has a Y chromosome, but when it tries to turn her male, right, from the default female state, she's insensitive to androgen. Her cells don't respond to it. So the male hormones, the androgens, aren't able to do their job. They're not able to turn her into a male like they normally would for somebody who's XY. So this means that even though she is chromosomally male, she's going to appear female. She doesn't have female sex organs. She has testes inside her body. Well, I think actually she mentioned that she had them surgically removed. Um, but, you know, she's male in terms of chromosomes, but female in terms of uh, physical appearance. And uh, this also shows how this sort of process can be kind of complicated. Uh, and it's also possible not just to have AIS, but to have different degrees of AIS. So you could be completely androgen insensitive, meaning you have no response to androgens, and in that case, your body is actually going to be sort of hyper-feminine. There's going to be no masculine, masculinization of your body because it's not responding to androgens at all. And, and most females have some response to androgens, right? Females do have some testosterone in their body. Uh, so that's going to be a complete case of this. Or you could have a mild case of this or a partial case of androgen insensitivity. That means you have some response but not the full response that other males have. 
And so you're going to end up sort of somewhere in between. And this could affect your genital development. It, it could affect your physical appearance in some ways. Um, so the, the reason I bring this up is that it shows even we have what appears initially to be this very clear distinction of we have you know male chromosomes or we have female chromosomes, it actually can get very complicated where we can have different uh, chromosome pairings, we can have missing chromosomes, we can have extra copies, and then we can have different response to what those chromosomes are trying to do. right? And so it gets very complicated very quickly even if we're just trying to look at the biology and that's without even getting into socialization and cognition and other things that are going to relate to our sense of whether we're male or female or something else. Okay, so I want to end with one more example of uh, molecular genetics, and this is a specific gene. Rather than talking about um, chromosomes here, I want to end with an example of PKU. All right, so what is PKU? This is a disorder called uh, phenylketonuria, and what happens in PKU? This is a case where we have something that is genetic and it is inherited. So you get this because you inherit these genes, this particular gene, from your parents. And the way that it works is you get two copies of this gene. If you get one bad copy and one good copy, then it's okay, you're fine. But if you get both versions, so from your mom and from your dad, you get a bad copy of this gene, then you end up with PKU. So what is PKU? Well, normally the good copy of this gene allows you to produce an enzyme. And this is an enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. PAH. Okay, so uh, if you have the good version of this gene, the, the sort of healthy version, you produce this phenylalanine hydroxylase. This phenylalanine hydroxylase is an enzyme that breaks down phenylalanine. Okay, so why do you want to break down phenylalanine? Well, phenylalanine is toxic. It's bad for your neurons. It can hinder their development. It can damage them. It can cause intellectual impairment. It can cause seizures. Uh, so phenylalanine is bad. You don't want it in your body. And the bad news is phenylalanine is in a lot of food. Right? Meats and cheeses and things uh, have phenylalanine in them. It's an amino acid that occurs naturally in these foods. So uh, if you have PKU, you don't produce this enzyme. If you don't have this enzyme, then you don't want phenylalanine in your body because you can't break it down anymore. So uh, if you do have phenylalanine in your body, it's going to accumulate and you're going to have this cognitive impairment, you're potentially going to have seizures and other problems. Okay, so what's the point of bringing this up? Well, here we have something that's clearly genetic, right? But we can still see the role of environment because it turns out that if you have PKU and you detect it early before any damage has been done, and we are able to detect this early, we can just avoid foods with phenylalanine and you can supplement your diet with some other amino acids. And what happens is now you're fine. You don't develop the impairment, you don't develop the seizures, because you avoid the phenylalanine, you don't allow it, to, allow it to accumulate, and therefore this thing that appeared to be purely genetic actually has this environmental component. Okay, so um, I hope this helped you to understand some of the complexity of some biology. Hopefully this wasn't too much at once, um, but we'll come back and we'll see other examples of chromosomal abnormalities, of genetic uh, abnormalities, of the role of specific individual genes on certain things. And essentially, you'll just see that it's really complicated. And even when things appear to be purely genetic, there's often still an environmental component. And that's really an important thing to keep in mind, that your genes, for the most part, are not fate, um, even in something like PKU. Uh, OK, so I hope you found this helpful. If so, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Thanks for watching.